Welcome. I'd like to talk a little bit about how to double check your paper before you submit it as a final draft. So what we have here is a student example paper and it is in APA formatting. So you can see that it has a title page with a different running head on page one compared to the rest of the pages. Some things that you want to double check, you know, make sure the headers are correct, make sure you have a title at the top of page two that matches the title page title, and make sure that it is capitalized appropriately with articles and uh, coordinating conjunctions and prepositions lowercase. But the title, uh, first word of the title and the subtitle capitalized no matter what kind of word they are. Uh, and if you use a title and a subtitle, make sure you include both at the top of page two and on your title page. However, you won't have room to put them all in your header, so you would use just the main title or even just part of the main title, depending on the length, because you need to make sure it does not cross about three-fourths of the way across the page on the header. So you can see how the title here is nice and short, so that is what's used in the header exclusively. And then you'll want to check things like paragraphs, make sure you don't have any unnecessary line breaks, make sure that the first line of each paragraph is indented with a tab. And if you are using sections in APA style, you need to make sure that the section headings are capitalized the same way as the title of the entire paper. So coordinating conjunctions, prepositions, uh, and articles are lowercase unless they're the first word of the subtitle or the uh, section title. And the rest of the words are capitalized. And although it may look a little bit weird, the main title on page two, the title of the whole paper, is not in bold, but the first level uh, section breakdowns have the section titles in bold. So bold and center justified. And so you'd want to scroll through and make sure that all of your sections are centered and bold and have the correct capitalization. Also double check that if you have a section title at the bottom of a page and none of that section appearing on that page, you would want to hit enter to get it to the top of the next page. Uh, but that is only if it's hanging out by itself on uh, the bottom of a page. Otherwise you let section headings fall wherever they may occur. And then you get to the last page here. We've got a references page with the reference entries listed. Some things to double check. Make sure the word references is center justified. No bold, no underline, no colon, nothing. And double check that your References are in alphabetical order. So actually you start with numbers if there are any and then A through Z. Make sure that they are using hanging indent. So the second plus lines of each reference entry are indented. So only the first line, uh, which in this case is the author for these, uh, the last name is hanging out flush left and the rest of the lines are indented with the tab. And then some other things that you can check would be to um, run a more specific spelling and grammar check with Microsoft Word. Now this doesn't replace you actually reading through your paper and checking for uh, correct word usage, looking for typos, um, doing a full editing where uh, you go through and you look for clarity of sentences and you go through a whole editing process as well. So this would be the last ditch effort to find errors after you've already read through and fixed on your own all of the issues that you can find with grammar and punctuation. So if you go to review in Microsoft Word, um, there's a spelling and grammar check that is set up with a, like a certain level of basic functionality, but there is a way to improve it. So if you go to file and you go to options and then you go to proofing, this is where all the information is provided about how it's going to proofread your paper for you. And again, since this is just a machine, you should be editing and proofreading your own paper first 
Um, but this is a latch, last ditch effort to catch things uh, with Microsoft Word. So some things that I would recommend changing. First of all, where it says writing style, if it says grammar or grammar only, I would change it to grammar and refinements, or sometimes it's called grammar and style, and click that. I would also click show readability statistics. Um, it's useful sometimes to know kind of what level of uh, writing the paper uh, is demonstrating. It's not foolproof because, again, it's a machine doing the assessment here, but it gives you a good sense of uh, what grade level this paper is written at. And if it's too high or too low, you can go back and uh, simplify sentences and words and word choices if it's too complex for your intended audience. Or if it's too simple for your intended audience, you could use more complex sentence structures, uh, longer words, more complex words, etc. And also what you can do is under grammar and refinements, if you click on settings, it'll tell you everything that it's looking for. And so you can see there's a bunch of uh, things that are already checked. You can also check to look for embarrassing words. I would assume that means like inappropriate curse words, etc. cetera. Uh, you can choose adverb placement, complex words, if you don't want complex words, conjunction overuse. I'm not too concerned about that. Double negation. So two <clears throat> negatives turn into a positive, so that could be an issue. If you're concerned about jargon, you can click on that. If you're worried about passive voice, where the subject of the sentence is not doing the action, you can click on that. Um, words with split infinitives, I wouldn't really be that concerned about, but uh, if you're worried about it or you know you have an instructor who's concerned about it, you can click on that. Colloquial verbs and phrases um, would be, you know, like metaphors and things that don't uh, have a place really sometimes in formal language. I'm not usually concerned about them. Contractions, I would argue, in almost any type of language, you can use contractions, even if you're writing some kind of formal document. The exception being maybe like a legal document. Informal language, not too concerned about that. Uh, you could put down slang, so any examples of slang words that are not, uh, for example, in the English dictionary or words that are but are noted as uh, not formal, formally accepted and defined words. If you're worried about inclusiveness, you can look for gender specific language like he said this. Uh, when you don't actually know the gender of the person. You can look for commas with adverbials or the Oxford comma I usually look for because it's you know consistent that you're supposed to have uh, a comma before the last item on a list. So that's what we call the Oxford comma. And a lot of people say, oh, you don't need it. But, you know, according to the rules of grammar, yes, you do. <laughs> And according to the rules of uh, companies being sued in the court of law and losing because they're missing Oxford commas, I would say it's best to just use the Oxford comma. And then you can look for cliches, which are overused phrases, uh, vague adjectives, uh, vague or unnecessary adverbs, weak verbs, whatever you'd like. The more you click, the more picky it's going to be, so just be aware of that. And then you can go ahead and hit OK. And then this time, when you run your spelling and grammar check, it will be more picky about what it's looking for. Because I said, hey, I want you to look for all these things that previously were not, um, you know, things that it was looking for. So you can go through and, you know, have it check it over. And remember that especially when it's on the pickier setting, it's possible that it's going to pick things out that are like not a big deal and you can ignore it. If it's something that could be fixed, you know, go ahead and fix it. And you go through. This is quite picky here. <laughs> and once you get done, Assuming we get there eventually. <laughs> All right, once you get done, what's going to pop up 
is the box on readability statistics. So this is where it will give you a sense of like the grade level that you're writing at and it'll give you a high level assessment of if you're meeting requirements or not. So for example, uh, at the very top it goes over the basics. How many words are in the document? And again, that's at the bottom left hand corner also. So if you are given a word count requirement, make sure that you're meeting that. Characters would be every single character, letter, space, etc. Uh, paragraphs, and it counts every line break as a paragraph. So in here, there aren't actually 29 paragraphs. It's just wherever you used a line break, including in the reference page that it's like, hey, that's a paragraph. And then the number of sentences and how it calculates the readability is it looks at things like the number of sentences per paragraph, the number of words per sentence, and the number of characters per word. And it takes all of that into consideration and it gives it a rating. So the flesh, can, uh, the flesh reading ease is a number. I would have to look at the chart uh, to see what the number represents. But one that's pretty easy to look at because it's talking about it as a grade level would be the Flesh Kincaid grade level. And so here it's 15.2, which means that it's roughly college level, right? So if you have uh, K through 12, 12th grade would be 12. The first year of college would be 13. Second year of college would be 14. Third year of college would be 15. So it's saying roughly that people need to have um, about three years of college experience to be comfortable reading this give or take. And again, that's an assessment that was created by uh, this these two people, Flesh Kincaid, who um, said that, you know, based on the number of sentences per paragraph, words per sentence, characters per word, difficulty of word level, etc., this is the grade level it's given. So it's interesting. It's not something to take and say this is exactly for this grade level. But if you're writing a college level paper and your grade level here is an eight, that's something to keep in mind that eighth graders can easily read and understand. That's not necessarily a bad thing because it's clear to eighth graders. But if your um, instructor, for example, gives you feedback that they want more complex sentences, more complex word choices, and you're getting an eight on the grade level, um, that probably is an indicator of why. And another thing to check before you submit your final draft is to make sure that you have no notes or edits or feedback visible on a paper. So what happens sometimes is if you're getting electronic feedback from somebody, they may have uh, made changes to your to your draft, and that can include uh, comment bubbles that appear in the right hand corner and also changes to the text itself using track changes and that's fine if you're working with a draft but when you're ready to submit a final draft you cannot have that visible in a paper period so what you need to do is either make those changes to your original draft before you got the feedback so you go through you say, okay, they say I should get rid of understanding here. I am going to agree with that and get rid of the word understanding on my draft. And you go through and you make the changes that way. Otherwise, you can get rid of comments and track changes feedback in the draft. But just be very careful you know what you're accepting and what you're rejecting. So first of all, all of the comment bubbles, you can click on those and click delete and the comment bubbles will disappear. And here, uh, the feedback that is using track changes, you'll notice that if the track changes have been made, but they're not showing you the changes, but they're still visible in the document, you'll see this red line here, and it'll also say simple markup up here. You need to choose all markup to be able to see what changes they're recommending you make, so you can decide to make them or not you can also click on the red line to show and hide. So for school, you can't just click on this and say, okay, it's clean, because your instructors are able to see this and click on it and be like, oh, well, somebody told you to get rid of this and to add this, and so they can see it on your final draft. 
So you need to get rid of any track changes, any wording that they've added, if they've added added it, you know, regularly and just bolded it or changed the color, whatever. Uh, you need to get rid of it out of the document. So what you can do with track changes here is you can see it says under review where the track changes information is. You can see the accept or reject. So if it is a change that you agree with, you can say I accept this and I want to move on to the next one. Or if you disagree with the suggested change, you can say I reject this and want to move to the next one. I reject this, want to move to the next one. And when you're done, it will say there aren't any comments or track changes in your document. Okay. One thing to note though is that you never want to accept all changes without reviewing because then you don't know exactly what they changed. And for me, for example, when I give feedback to people, not only will I delete words and add words that I think should be deleted and added, I can also put notes in a document using track changes. So just for example, hey, this chunk of information should be a little lower. Well, if you accept all, then it turns that comment into part of your actual paper, which you don't want. And also as you're making changes, you know, make sure that you do not have track changes on. So make sure that you click it off so that it's not recording changes that you make to your document as you're editing. So that's what we refer to as a clean draft, is that it does not have any comments, it does not have any track changes, it doesn't have any font, text added, different colors, different uh, emphasis, bold, underline, etc. from people that have reviewed your document. So that is something that's very important as well. And then if you think you're done, I would maybe suggest reading through it, if you have time, <laughs> reading through it one more time just to check because I don't know about you, but what happens to me is I'll say, okay, this is good to go. I'm going to submit it. I submit it for whatever purpose, for school, for publication, etc. And then I'll look at the document again and I will see that I've missed something, right? So there was an error that I missed or there is something that I could have fixed and made it better. Uh, right before submission. And uh, the issue with that is, you know, especially if it's an error, if it's not something that's okay, but could have been better, it's an actual error. You know, people think that errors are because you aren't trying hard enough or you don't care, right? <clears throat> so it's important that when you are submitting, you're catching as many of those errors as possible. And when you're submitting for school, be aware if you can only submit one file and that's it, or if you can submit as many files as you want prior to the deadline and it is um, accepting those. You know, be aware of that. Uh, if it's one and done, that's one shot, that's it. Or if you are submitting close to the deadline and you submit something and then you notice a spelling error, like the wrong word was used, uh, spelled correctly, but it's the wrong word, you can actually fix it and then resubmit your file. All right, well, thanks for watching and good luck out there. And remember, take time, give yourself some time to review your paper. Uh, don't leave everything to the last minute because that's when you have errors and inconsistencies in formatting, etc. All right, I'll see you around.